welcome to Forests, Folklore, and Fantasy. My name is Kelly, but I write and publish under my initials, K.M. Rice. Wherever you are, I would like to thank you for lending me your ear and giving me a bit of valuable time. Your support has meant so very much to me, and this podcast sincerely would not be the same without you. I would like to share with you today a little bit more about myself, a little bit more about my upbringing and where I come from, because I do come from a rural background and I feel that that has played a large role in forming who I am as a person and obviously continues to be an influence in my writing, in my creativity, in the way that I look at the world. But the term rural doesn't really cover much. I read a statistic recently that said the majority of the U.S. population now lives in cities. So... I understand that the point of view I represent in my lifestyle, while often romanticized and glorified, is something that many people have not been exposed to. And again, since it informs my writing and my educational offerings and my worldview, I wanted to expose you to a bit more of who I am Because if you're listening to this, I think I owe you at least that much. Not only will this information give you insight into the voice behind the microphone, as it were, but you might also gain something from stepping into another person's skin and seeing through their eyes for just a little while. I was born and raised in the Santa Cruz Mountains of California. I've met a lot of people from outside of my state and, of course, from various parts of the world who have the understandable impression that California is all sunshine and coastlines and palm trees and beautiful golden beaches. And while that certainly is true, It's also true that California holds vast deserts, the incredible Sierra Nevada mountain range, beautiful lakes, gorgeous reservoirs, and rainforests. Where I live, in a typical year, we get enough rain to qualify as a rainforest. California is a big state, and the Santa Cruz Mountains are located just north of central California. We are on the cusp of the Bay Area, which has caused many economic hardships and woes for those of us born and raised here who didn't come in because we got offered a shiny, very well-paying job from the tech industry over in the Silicon Valley. But it's a beautiful place full of a mixture of hippies and surfers and and liberals, conservatives and scientists. Most people, when they think of California, don't necessarily think of mountains, but we have a lot of mountains. And these mountains are so special and unique because I get to call the Coastal Redwoods home. And growing up, I didn't understand that this was a unique thing. I didn't know how rare these trees and these forests were. I don't personally live beneath the boughs of a redwood, but all I have to do is look out a window and see their magnificent canopy carpeting the mountains all around me. 
if you've watched any of my videos on my KM Rice YouTube channel or perhaps on Happy Hobbit, you will have glimpsed these forests. In fact, I was so spoiled that when I was a little girl, I was obsessed with the Ewoks from Star Wars, the Ewok movie Battle for Endor. Apparently, I wouldn't go anywhere without my VHS tape of the Ewoks. And the Ewoks, of course, likewise live in a redwood slash sequoia forest. And again, that was reflecting my reality. That was reflecting what I saw to be as normal. And so it wasn't until I was significantly older, in fact, after high school and had traveled a bit and seen a bit of the world that I understood that the rest of the world didn't necessarily have redwoods. And if you don't know what a redwood tree is, they are among the longest lived and tallest, biggest trees in the entire planet. Every town, every place has something that makes it individual and unique, but the redwoods are something I can point to. Statistically, there's something I can quantify to say this makes where I come from a unique place. As you may have guessed by now, I grew up on a piece of property that originally had no fences, except for those used to keep the horses in their pens. I could roam. I could wander into the woods. I could learn bird calls and mimic them. I had such a luxurious experience with the natural world that I feel so blessed to have had because many don't have access to natural spaces in that way. But because of that gift, I naturally started to observe the ecology around me and make the connections of the food web and how seedlings began to grow under the forest canopy. When flowers bloomed, when the leaves fell, all of these wonderful observations that still continue to connect me to the natural world. In many ways, I felt that my upbringing was almost a handicap. And I'll explain that to you, or rather contextualize it, because when I did start venturing out into the world, when I went to university, when I started traveling, I met people from more urban spaces. And of course, my university was located in a very urban space. And I realized that others were content with far less than me. Others were happy with a little backyard or perhaps no backyard. Others didn't know any different. What I was experiencing and continue to experience is something I feel is much more innate to being a human being, but it's this wanderlust, this desire to roam on my own two feet. The more I explore through hiking and adventuring, the more unexplored places I want to be able to access from my front door. It's a strange thing that happens that the more of the wild that you get to encounter, the more natural spaces you get to journey into, the more space you realize you actually need to feel that buffer between you and society, to feel like the world is as it should be which is the world in its natural state. At least that's my way of thinking. And pretty soon here, I'm going to record an episode that unpacks that concept a bit more, that really examines our idea of nature. But what I observed 
was that my peers who had grown up in more urban environments were not bothered by smaller spaces and they weren't bothered by the concept of relocating. There are probably a multitude of reasons why I've always been hesitant to permanently relocate, chief among them being my love of my family. And when I was younger and it was less common for grown children to live at home, it's become increasingly common now, and just for reference, it was the norm until the Second World War and the housing boom, and this narrative that each should have their own household, because that contributed to the growing economy. Before it was more normalized like it is today, my answer to those who would ask, well, why are you still living at home with your family, would be, because people die, and I love them, and I don't know how much time I have, and I don't know how much time they have, and I want to spend it with them. And for a long time, we had what many outsiders called a farm, because we had a lot of different livestock, and there was a lot of work that went into that, and it wouldn't have really been feasible for all of us to leave with all of that responsibility being left behind. But suffice it to say that a part of me was envious of my peers who I saw more emotionally capable of relocating. I felt this, again, what I always thought of as a handicap, acutely when I started winning screenwriting competitions and was starting to be pressured to relocate to Los Angeles and... Nothing against Los Angeles. It is a great place to visit. And many find a fulfilling life there. But it stands in stark contrast to what to me is reality. And to me, reality is the growing world, the natural world. And so... I found myself in situations where I couldn't just explain to people that if I removed myself from the land, I would be removing myself from a part of me. These mountains are a part of me. If we have souls, they're woven into mine. It's not just the people who I love. It is the place. And I find it incredibly rare to meet and connect with another human being who likewise feels such a rootedness and connection and spiritual love of a place that in turn makes it difficult for them to leave. It makes it difficult for them to rupture that connection to place. And I felt like that was a weakness of mine. I felt that I was just being overly childish and sentimental. How could I explain the love that I feel for an oak tree and the little pine struggling to grow beneath it to someone who couldn't even tell me the difference between an oak and a pine? Now, don't get me wrong, I love to travel. I love to see other parts of the world. But I also love to come home to this beautiful place and to this land and landscape and the smells and the sounds that I love. While it may not come as a surprise that I did not relocate to Los Angeles, you may not know that I have traveled there for several different writing jobs that I've been fortunate enough to have. And I feel so lucky that in 
about an hour I can fly from where I live to such a metropolis as LA, where there is a lot of work for people in with my skill set. I went through a period of time nearly 10 years ago now, working on a project for which I'm still under a NDA, a non-disclosure agreement, probably in perpetuity. But suffice it to say, I was going back and forth, and I really love that. I really love being able to work in a place like that and then come home. Um, the same happened for me when I worked in New Zealand for a bit, and New Zealand's another... New Zealand's an incredible place. I would never compare it to Los Angeles, uh, but that's a story for another time. But when I was doing this job, again, it was some time ago, there was less emphasis on work from home or remote work, and so it was necessary for me to be present more often than perhaps it would be now. And I was in the city enough for me to feel homesick and disconnected. Again, it's very difficult for me to, and very rare for me to ever encounter another individual who understands the land sickness I feel, not homesick necessarily, but land sick. And the nearest I could ever come to articulating it or expressing it to others was, well, there's no nature here. And I would inevitably be referred to a suburban neighborhood that had some trees, and they'd say that would be a great place if you ever wanted to relocate. Or to Griffith Park, which is a large park in L.A. Um, and I realized they looked at the world very different than me. They they looked at the world with nature as a, a thing with its own place, like its own designated area. Kind of like... If you're not from California, this may come as news to you, and it, it, it sounds really silly even to me, but to me it's also very normal. We use this term called the snow. So if you're going to go into the mountains to go skiing or snowboarding or what have you, we'd say you're going to the snow. I mean, if you replace it with you're going to the rain, it just sounds ridiculous. And to some someone from a place where it snows all winter or it snows regularly, it must sound hilarious. But... In the same way that we in this state have this concept of going to the snow, I feel like a lot of people have this concept of going to the nature by going to visit a park. And that just isn't my experience of the world. And I would sometimes get frustrated by the friction I felt internally between what I was trying to express and obviously failing to articulate and what was being heard in the response. As such, I did a very healthy thing. Uh, I wrote a piece about it. I can't recall if I've ever shared this piece publicly. It's possible that I used it once way back when, when I had a blog. I would like to read it to you now because not only do I feel it captures the essence of my childhood in many ways and where I come from, but also because I am old enough now to recognize that it contains the echoes of a fast-fading world. This piece is titled in response to Los Angeles. We grew up dodging rattlesnakes and seeing our mother pound them to death with a two-by-four piece of wood. Huck Finn felt like a friend, and a boy used to waltz up the deer path to tell us tales about the principal and show off his skunk trap that he'd set in a hollow log. We ate deer killed by an arrow and raised abandoned baby rabbits. We drank water from a well that pumped it straight out of the ground. I once saw a bat catch my brother's flying cowboy hat in the dusk and felt the talons of a red-tailed hawk in my hair when we startled it out of a tree. We found arrowheads 
and shark teeth that reminded us that we were very small. And the whistle of a 150-year-old steam train down the road was as natural as bird song. Our teachers were in the past, and our dad had an 1897 revolver in a case on the wall that we weren't allowed to touch because gunslingers were sexy, but the real heroes had names like Red Cloud and Black Kettle, and we would pause on quiet knolls because they had been silenced by progress and death, and we could never speak. My first real word was outside and my mother dressed me in double-layered pants so I could crawl among the rocks and grasses and dogs while she gardened. We ran with our quarter-wolf canines, and at night we heard coyote yips and owl screeches and hoots among the chorus of crickets and frogs. We lost each other in rainstorms and almost blew over on mountaintops. We ate wild boar and fell off horses and chased deer and seagulls. Our local celebrities weren't football players, but instead were the fastest girls in the nation. Even if their times didn't always count, since they were run on our gravel track. I stalked and spied on hikers for no reason other than the thrill of knowing they couldn't see me. And one night... My instincts were so sharp that I was right and the police's tracking dog was wrong. We searched for Bigfoot and found antlers and skeletons and shotgun shells instead. One summer sunset, I chased down wayward sheep in a nightgown. I stroked our dying dogs as they left and wept like a banshee as my big brother horse fell down as he died. There was a stillborn, but there were healthy kids too, and I wiped the amniotic fluid off of a baby goat's nose and watched her take her first breaths. I followed mountain lion tracks and watched them from afar, stalked a black bear, and had to hightail it as fast as my legs would carry me more times than I could ever count. Some of those times, I felt sure I was a deer, and that I was flying. I patched wounds and trees with mud, and the boys I smiled at in high school only wanted to know if the rumors of my big brother and his shotgun were true. We dug trenches in the rain and scooped manure and chopped and stacked wood. My room was full of wildflowers in the spring, and cleaning up meant getting rid of rocks and pine cones and leaves that I had collected. In class, we raced steelhead trout and released them in the river that is the life force of our valley. I've clung to mountain slopes and dangled from tree roots over cliff edges and was rescued from falling by my grandma who came from the Great Plains. Some of my greatest adventures were on the back of a horse or at the sight of a dog. My brothers and sister and I taunted each other and left bruises on each other's bodies and were threatened with military school but would sneak food to the other whenever we were kicked out of the house and plotted the deaths of any who dared cause one of us pain. The arrival of a stranger meant checking where our weapons were and greeting them with a pellet gun and boxers if we were home alone on a Saturday night. We listened to southern crooners on the radio and frowned when they sang of fried chicken and clear streams and a god we had never heard nor seen much tell of. A good day meant the sting of cuts and the stain of dirt by the end, and every summer the sun etched new freckles into our brown, unprotected skin. We started fires that we stamped out and were afraid of chainsaws in the distance and carved reindeer in the winter and wore almost nothing in the summer, least of all shoes. Sometimes we even rode our horses that way, and to this day I have to cover myself in dirt to wash the city off me. 
I've written this in run-ons and stream of consciousness, past tense, even though most of it is still ongoing. The point is that when you say you learned to fish when you were small, or have hiked Yosemite, or that you love to camp, and expect me to think you somehow understand, you are wrong. All these thoughts and more fly through my head, but my only response will be a smile, because I grew up privileged by the thunder of hooves and the wind in my hair, and I belong to the hissing of the pines and the sweet scents of dried grasses beneath the oaks. I am handicapped in a way you will never see, for I have been wrought of mountain song and cannot live in a city if I wish for my heart, mind, or body to thrive in any way. I am envious of those of you who can adapt and change your colors, but not enough to forget that my great weakness is also my strength, and that the heart of me is as complicated as the history of the American West, and as simple as a songbird. Looking back at that piece now nearly a decade later, I'm just so thankful to my former self for writing it. There were some memories in there that are faded for me now. There are parts of that piece that are no longer so pertinent to my identity in terms of something tangible in my everyday life, but needless to say, our childhoods form and shape and govern so much of our lives as adults. And I appreciate you listening. I appreciate you having a glimpse into someone else's perspective. One of the more amusing observations about my <laughs> my upbringing in this place that did it make it into that piece? Potentially, because at the time that I wrote it, I still didn't realize how unusual it was. Uh, would be that at my high school, when we were sent out to run for physical education, for PE, we were just sent into the forest. And we had different natural markers like the fallen log. Because if you didn't know, it takes redwoods potentially centuries to decay. That's how resistant their bark and their wood is to various forms of mildew and mold and things of that nature. But uh, so a fallen log could, could be there for many generations. And um, yes, yeah, so we had markers like the fallen log or the big hill or the first bridge or the second bridge. And those were all rough estimates of how many miles we were going to go that day. And yeah, that was something that I didn't quite realize was unique until, again, I started learning about other people's educational experiences. To supplement that, there is a more urban community nearby, and apparently the kids in that school would make fun of the kids in our school by saying that our PE was actually being lumberjacks, that our PE was chopping wood, and that that's what us hicks did. But Thankfully, we had a counterbalance. Our teachers repeatedly pointed to the fact that, as I alluded in that piece that I wrote, we were churning out top-notch teenage athletes, and they felt that the reason for that was because we were mountain kids. They're like, for heaven's sake, just to get home, you guys have to climb hills. Um, so they felt like we were in better physical condition than perhaps our more urban peers for years, I thought that coming from this background, 
meant that I was in a deficit in some way. But as you can see, by the time I wrote that piece, I was coming to terms with the fact that my weakness was actually my strength. And I have a very key figure in my life to thank for supporting and validating me in coming to that realization. And that would be Richard Taylor, technically Sir Richard Taylor. Those of you outside of us hardcore Lord of the Rings film fans may need some some background on who he is. Um, he's a New Zealander who co-founded Weta Workshop, which is a prop design and special effects company. They essentially are the creative minds who brought to life the visuals you see on screen in the Lord of the Rings films. But not only the Lord of the Rings films, also the Hobbit films, the Avatar films, King Kong, so, so many, many, many. Look them up if you're curious at all. Uh, they've won multiple Academy Awards, and they're very well respected in Hollywood and in the film industry in general. But I met Richard at a party at San Diego Comic-Con many years ago now, and we were just chatting as people. And I would say within less than a half hour, he had a read on me that no manager, no agent, no one I had spoken to yet in Los Angeles had. And it was like he understood me for who I was and where I was coming from without me even being able to articulate it at the time. And he said to me, I can tell just from talking to you that your mountains, your home, your family, where you're from are a huge source of inspiration for your writing. And my fear over you relocating would be that you would find you could no longer create. And he said that to me because I'm sure at some point in the conversation I had brought up, oh, I, you know, I've been working with this manager and she wants me to move and I'm just not sure how I feel about that. And when he said that, I remember having this moment going, wow, this, I believe, five-time Oscar winner just gave me this advice. He just told me that my instincts were correct to not remove myself from my soul soil, to not remove myself from my muse. And that was very emboldening to me. Later, I happened to bump into him again that same trip, and he wanted to apologize. He worried he had overstepped. He said, you know, I gave you some unsolicited advice, and I want to apologize if that was, you know, rude or insulting. I thought, no. Oh my gosh, no, are you kidding? I've been riding that wave for the past, like, 24 hours. It's it's It was amazing to feel like I was seen, and he's one of those rare people who only come every so often, who has this incredibly uncanny ability to see people and to see their talent, even when they can't see it in themselves. As you may have guessed, I later had the pleasure of working for Richard and for Weta Workshop. I don't know why I didn't tell this part of my writing story in my like initial About Me episode, but I did live in New Zealand and for a short time. And... Yes, worked at what I, with many of these incredibly talented creative people on a massive book called Middle Earth from Script to Screen, Building the World of the Lord of the Rings and the Hobbit. And I co-authored that with the lovely, wonderful, dear friend of mine, Daniel Falconer. And originally my name was going to be beside his on the cover, but because Peter Jackson wrote the foreword... <laughs> And Peter Jackson, the director of the Lord of the Rings and the Hobbit trilogies, has a lot more re name recognition than I have and likely will ever have. So my name got bumped for his, but uh, it was a wonderful experience to get to do that. And that's a story I'll have to tell sometime. But it was wonderful to have that validation from someone I so respected and admired at that time in my life where I was really going through the transi transition of I'd left grad school, I'd finished, 
and was looking for work and finding how difficult it was to actually make a living as a screenwriter or as a novelist. And sadly, that part hasn't changed. But it did me so much good to have someone confirm what I felt deep down inside. That same trip to San Diego Comic-Con with my sister, we met several other wonderful people. Um, downtown San Diego is an incredibly urban environment. We were gawking at all the tall buildings and people were playfully laughing with us being like where are you from that you haven't seen big buildings like this or really even been around them and we're like not from here we're not from here and people were fascinated to learn about our somewhat different lifestyle they're fascinated to learn that we got our eggs from our chickens that we had horses that we had sheep that we had goats that we had a peacock at the time we even had a peacock well he had us he adopted us. Uh, we had cats, we had dogs. For a while, we had guinea pigs. So we had a menagerie. And that just isn't super common. And when you're around other ag people, other agricultural people, you forget that it's not always super common. And that, in part, is what birthed my idea for our web show, Happy Hobbit, because I realized yeah, we are living in a way that is a little more connected to the earth than the average person and perhaps a bit more self-sufficient or sustainable. And people are curious to learn about that. People are curious to know more. So that, my friends, is more or less where our web show Happy Hobbit came from. It's still on YouTube and you can check it out at any time. I'll put the link in the comments. Um, and the goal of that web show is to bring Middle Earth to your daily life. As of right now, I still reside in that same childhood home that I was talking about in that piece I wrote. With the vast majority of my siblings, we have all found a way to make it work and are respectful of each other's space and, of course, help our parents whenever we can. Sadly, we do not have as many livestock as we used to. As they passed on, they just weren't replaced for several reasons, but one of the primary reasons being the costs associated with keeping goats and keeping horses. That's something that, again, if, if maybe one day one of my books hits it big, or maybe perhaps even this podcast will get some kind of fancy sponsor and livestock will once again find their home on our little ranch, especially horses. We really miss having a horse, but Vet bills are really high. The cost of feed and hay is really high. We miss, we miss all of our animals that we've lost. But we're ever hopeful that one day, hopefully not in the too distant future, we'll have more. But the deer paths are still there. There are a few too many fences for my liking around the place, but I feel really blessed that I still get to call this majestic, rural place home. The gift of this land was really highlighted during lockdown in 2020, and even into 2021, where, sure, I felt a little stir-crazy because I couldn't socialize other than with the people in my household, but thankfully I've got quite a few people in my household, and there's quite a bit of room to walk around without even leaving our property by comparison to a lot of other people, I had that access to natural spaces that other people didn't have. And even now I continue to engage and grow and learn with this land. I am an incredibly enthusiastic gardener. We have a fantastic vegetable garden. Um, my patrons get to see quarterly updates on what's going on in the garden 
and I've branched out into flowers more. And in fact, I'm intending to do an episode talking a bit more about gardening. But it's wonderful to be able to feed my family with some of the produce that we've grown. It's so incredibly rewarding to surf potatoes that, by the way, taste so much better than store-bought potatoes. To surf potatoes that we grew in our own soil just a few feet away. Throughout my adulthood and my presence online as a public persona, I hesitate to say throughout my career because I don't really feel like I've gained enough momentum to truly say I've had a career. But throughout my presence online and professionally, I do maintain this rootedness to this place that I'm from and my knowledge of the natural world from being so lucky to have grown up in the place in the time that I grew up in. And even though I fashion myself as more of an academic and an educator and an author and a creative person, I don't think I could truly inhabit any of those roles if I didn't have this background. And I think it really facilitates my connection to folklore and to indigenous European customs because I have a tangible connection to a more agrarian lifestyle and to feeling the effects of the weather and the changing seasons and how they impact my lifestyle and my ability to create. Don't get me wrong, there are a lot of hardships living in the mountains right now. I'm just looking outside at the trees waving a bit more than I'm comfortable with in the winter wind as the storm passes through. I couldn't work on this podcast last weekend because we had lost um, internet. We'd lost Wi-Fi. And just before that, we had lost our power again due to a storm. So many folks out here have generators. Most people have a chainsaw in their car because you never know if you're leaving the house early and there's a down tree or a down branch and you might need to hop out and clear it out of the way so you could just leave your house. Um, we have dealt with one of the most catastrophic wildfires in California history. Um, it was certainly the worst in our area for over 150 years. That happened in 2020. There was a lot of living in 2020. <laughs> um, so these are all just part and parcel with living this way of life. Downed trees, trees falling on your property. That happened to us a few weeks ago. Trees damaging your home. Um, fires, the risk of fire all summer long, even through autumn. And then... Ironically, you switch that fear of fire in the dry months around to this need of fire because a lot of people heat their homes through wood stoves. And so then suddenly you're courting fire once again. And it's a beautiful way to live for me. It helps me stay grounded as I walk the wheel of the year and it helps me stay in connection with the land and the changing seasons and... The reminder that there is so much more outside of my little sphere in whatever my little troubles may be. So I hope you have enjoyed this little journey into my past and a corner of my identity. And I hope that it was enriching to you to step into someone else's point of view for a little bit and have a look around and... See, see what was there and, and maybe you've learned something from it. Maybe you'll take something from this episode with you forward into your daily life, even if it's just the knowledge that there are still people out there who live this way. And oh my gosh, there are people out there. We've got friends who live off the grid and have always been off the grid. I think since like the 1800s, these people have like history literally on their land a leg that was ripped off by a grizzly bear 
back when we had grizzlies here in California, was buried on their property, and those were the tales that were told in their family. So, so by no means is my life or my lifestyle as rural as it gets. In fact, for a long time, I hesitated to even call us rural because, you know, really, in less than 10 minutes, I can be at a grocery store. I know people who are far more removed from society than, than we are. By the same token, I've had a friend, again, from my university in the city come visit, stand on our deck, look around and say, I couldn't live here. I couldn't live like this. And I said, why? And she said, it feels too much like camping. There's, there's, there's too much outside. And I've, I've had other friends come and visit and be like, I had no idea you lived out in the sticks. So it really all just depends on what your baseline is and what your perspective is of normal. And as I established in the beginning of this episode, my baseline for normal was very different than what I found to be true when I started meeting people from more urban areas and traveling. I hope, too, that this further insight into the voice behind the microphone helps enhance your experience as you continue to listen to this podcast. And if you have any interest in accessing my educational materials, you'll know that there's at least a modicum of life experience behind the education on living an agrarian lifestyle. And I do emphasize that, a modicum. My existence, thankfully, is not dependent on what I grow or what I raise. And if it were, I would not have time to record something like this. So thank you very much again for listening and gifting me some of your time. The music you have heard in this episode is from the fantasy-themed album The Lands Beyond by Lane Thomas. And if you're curious about the web show I'm, I produce that I mentioned called Happy Hobbit, or my books or my educational materials and offerings, please do check out the links in the show notes to learn more. As ever, I'm so thankful to my patrons for helping make this show possible. You are more than welcome to join and have a look around on my Patreon page at any time and select a tier if you, too, would like some benefits. Thank you so much again, and until next time, may your hearth be warm and your heart be full. Mm-hmm.